If the Labour Party is the chief beneficiary of declining Conservative Party support, many former Tories are fleeing the sinking ship to find salvation in a new home. Reform UK. That party is seen as further to the political right, with immigration control as a strong central pillar of its politics. Well, bolstered by the charismatic but divisive leadership of leading Brexiteer Nigel Farage, Reform UK has shocked pollsters by threatening to overtake the Conservatives as the second most popular party in the country. I'm joined now by Reform UK's Deputy Chairman, Ben Habib. Ben, thank you for making the time for this discussion, of course, at a crucial time in UK politics. And, and I'm just thinking the big stories of the election right now are, of course, the return of Labour, discontent with the Conservatives and, of course, the rise of the Reform Party. And I wonder, to what degree is it the first two that are determining the Reform Party's fate rather than perhaps its proposals and agenda? Oh, absolutely. We only exist because the Conservative Party and Labour Party have utterly failed the country over the last 25 years, Tony Blair set out an agenda which undermined our democracy, our constitutional arrangements. The Conservative Party continued with it, and um, they've damaged our economy, our cultural fabric, and, and, and further damage to the Constitution and our democracy. So Reform UK is the manifestation of the two legacy parties, as I call them, having failed to do their job. So... It sounds like reform's time has come, and Nigel Farage, who's now back in leadership there, uh, announced a manifesto recently talking about the contract with the people that he's proposed, and he called it to that specifically because he feels there's a, there's a missing element to what's being done now. Take me through very briefly the elements of this, this contract. So the underlying building block of our entire manifesto is that it's a novel, which politicians seem to have... But we used to be... Uh, taken for granted, but politicians seem to have forgotten it, which is that you have to build policies around what is in the British national interest and what is in the interest of the British people. So every single policy you see in that document is with those two critical components at its heart, at their heart. And the so it is, for example, the cutting of taxes on the working and middle classes by raising thresholds for income tax. It is the jettisoning of unnecessary regulations that the Conservative Party inherited from Europe but hasn't done anything about. It's also about fixing our democracy. So um, turning our backs on the World Economic Forum, on the WHO pande pandemic arrangements, taking proper control of our fishing waters, ejecting the European Union from Northern Ireland, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. And But the common thread, as I say, through the whole document is the championing and, 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 uh, of, of British national interests. And Ben, at least one poll has you leapfrogging over the Conservatives, and I wonder how significant that would be politically if it was reflected in the poll when the vote is taken. It's very significant. For months I've been forecasting we would overtake the Conservatives, and it's significant because what it means is, well, first of all, we're going to win seats, but perhaps more importantly at this juncture in, 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 the, in the general election, is that the, the electorate can see that contrary to all the arguments being made by the Conservative Party that a vote for reform is either a waste in vote or a vote for Labour. Actually, if you vote reform, you're going to get reform MPs. And if you get reform MPs, we'll be able to influence debate in the Commons and change the way the country is governed. So it's very significant that we have overtaken the Conservative Party in this one new golf poll. Uh, but I expect, by the way, for us to be doing it increasingly as we head towards the 4th of July. The political wind has been in our sails for months and, it's, and, 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 and the Conservative Party is sailing into the wind. And the Labour Party, by the way, is not popular with the populace. The reason they're doing well in the polls is not because their vote share has gone up. It's because those voters who would typically vote Conservative are staying at home. They're, just not even, they're not even being registered in the polls. And if we can get through to them, and if we can reach Labour voters and make the case, as is the case, that the Reform Party stands for British working class in a way that the Labour Party does not. If we can, if those two things can happen, I think you could see a very, very different outcome from this general election than people are currently forecasting. Now, assuming you don't get through to those voters, uh, the, the chance of voting reform might actually then be a super enabler for Labour by splitting the, the vote of the Conservatives. I mean, are you happy with that? 
Well, the Conservative Party and the Labour Party are two halves of the same, two sides of the same coin. You know, people like to talk as if there's a centre left and a centre right, the Labour Party centre left and the Conservative Party centre right, and that's a completely mistaken belief. They're both effectively globalist parties. They both believe in net zero. They both believe in mass immigration. They both believe in governance through supranational institutions. Neither of them believe in the uh, in the nation state that is the United Kingdom, which is why we've got borders that are completely porous and unenforced. They are basically the same political organism. The Conservatives will deliver whatever Labour will. They'll just do it marginally uh, more slowly than Labour. Though I have to say, based on the immigration that we've experienced in the last two years, three years, it's absolutely staggering the way the Conservative Party has completely collapsed on that subject. And of course, if you're if you're if you've got completely open borders, you cease to be the country that we are or were. And as I said, our policy, our central building block for our policy is to put British national interests first, and that you know fundamentally means secure borders. Now you, you are standing as a candidate, as is uh, Nigel Farage, but. It's, easy, it's not easy to convert those votes into seats in the parliamentary system with the first-past-the-post uh, system that Britain has. So you could end up with millions of votes, but actually very little physical representation in Parliament itself. How, how do you feel about that? Well, it, uh, people have been saying this to me for months, and I've said the political winds are in our sails, and you can't judge the number of seats we're going to get based on the current polling level. And we are now forecast to get seven seats, according to Servation, which is a polling company. And as I say, I think as we approach the 4th of July, I think those forecasts are going to go up. And by the way, for an insurgent party to get seven seats, if, the, if we do get seven seats in accordance with that poll, would be politically seismic. It's never happened in the history of British politics. And if we get more than that, my goodness, it will mean two things. It will mean Labour won't have the something majority that people think it, 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 it's going to have. And it will mean our voice will be a very important one in the Commons. Now, even if the uh, dismal forecast for the Conservatives come true, uh, it would still be the Conservatives or Liberal uh, Democrats leading the opposition in the House of Commons anyway, wouldn't it? Yeah, but, you know, they would have to pivot to our arguments. The Conservative Party, unless it wants to get further decimated, um, you know, would have to pivot to our arguments. And as I say, we're not at the 4th of July yet. We're not there yet. And I think the Conservatives have got further to fall. Well, in fact, uh, Nigel Farage is, you know, has said in his interviews he's looking forward to uh, 2029, a five-year plan, where he actually would like to see himself as Prime Minister running for that position. But he's been sort of, uh, something of advisive and controversial character uh, for a lot of people. And I wonder, could you see him as Prime Minister, considering that? Well, I think if Nigel stays the distance, stays as leader, wins a seat in the Commons now, stays as leader, and builds around him a strong team, a team that can actually deliver not just ideas and policies, but deliver execution and governance, but then I think, yeah, absolutely, he could and should be Prime Minister. It depends really on what happens at this general election and also what Nigel does with the victory if we get this relative victory in this general election, what he does with it. The Reform UK Party uh, is probably best known for its domestic UK policies, perhaps as the name implies, S things such as uh, tackling crime, immigration, bolstering defence, taxes and so on. So I wonder what kind of impact do you think Nigel Farage would have if he did become the leader of the country when it comes to the global stage and foreign policies? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right to say that, you know, our agenda is mostly domestic. It's because, as I said, you know, our our whole policy agenda is based around promoting British national interests and um, and the and the interests of the British people. But central to that is rebuilding our armed forces. So we want to take um, national spend on the armed forces to two and a half percent, and then in short order to three percent of GDP after that. And we will be actually making our position as a country much stronger by having a renewed uh, you know, armed force, which has been you know, hollowed out by successive governments. And I think we'll be much stronger on the national stage, on the international stage. But we won't get stuck in the kind of interventions that Tony Blair and David Cameron got stuck in, which, showed, which, which produced very little to close to no benefit. I'd say actually no benefit, probably detriment overall 
to the British people. Afghanistan didn't pay off. Iraq didn't pay off. What we did in Libya didn't pay off. What we did in Syria was everything's been a disaster under these successive governments. And we've got to start off. We've got to start making foreign policy decisions again based on national interest. And at the heart of that is rearming the United Kingdom. Talking of national interests, of course, uh, Nigel Farage is known to have a, a close relationship with Donald Trump. Uh, assuming that he, as a prime minister of uh, the UK, had to deal with someone like a Donald Trump, who gets to say what's what in the relationship, the special relationship across the Atlantic, when you have someone who's very determined on the other side uh, and you have Nigel Farage looking at national interests? Yeah, but, you know, we've had this before and it worked incredibly well between Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher. And though Ronald Reagan was an incredibly strong and powerful and robust leader, he respected Maggie greatly and he was an Anglophile. And in Trump, you have, again, a very strong character, but an Anglophile and someone who does respect Nigel Farage. Maggie Thatcher had undue influence, if you like, given the relative sizes of our respective countries. But she had very, very significant in, uh, influence over Ronald Reagan. I can see Nigel Farage having the same effect on, on, Do on Donald Trump. Now, reform has a lot of familiar faces from those who previously uh, supported UKIP, the UK Independence Party, and the Brexit Party. Now that Britain's exit from the EU has been accomplished and delivered by Boris Johnson, has it, in your opinion, been everything you dreamed of, or is, is it essentially a disaster? Well, the Brexit hasn't been delivered. We voted for the United Kingdom to leave the EU leave the single market, leave the customs union. And actually the deal that Boris Johnson d d has done has left Northern Ireland subject to EU laws, put a border down the Irish Sea, broken the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It's also hitched at the hip, the, the rest of the United Kingdom, Great Britain in other words, in a whole host of regulatory aspects, including military and uh, human rights aspects, you know, issues and policies with the EU, and we've got to break that. We've got to rewrite that contract. And if you read on our contract with the people, you will see that actually some of the things that I've just said have been addressed in it, including taking back Northern Ireland, taking control of our fishing waters, ejecting the European Court of Human Rights, and so on. Ben, just as a final thought, as I was discussing a bit earlier, you know, Nigel Farage has seen something as... Uh, something of a divisive character. He's the man at the moment, a lot of support, then also a lot of detractors. And he's had things like milkshakes and things thrown at him uh, as he goes across the campaign trail. I wonder to what degree, knowing him as a person, you feel that it just it's something that he just, you know, sweeps past uh, under the rug, perhaps, uh, or does he take it more seriously uh, and, and think it's something that should be addressed? What, the personal abuse that he gets? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Nigel has been a lightning rod for holding opinions that, you know, the, the the majority didn't hold, but the majority has come round. And actually, I would argue that the vast majority of British people have views in keeping with Nigel. It's just that the political class didn't have the courage to espouse them. The challenge for Reform UK and the challenge for Nigel, if we do well in this election and get seats in, in the Commons, is then how we turn into not just a force for change, but how we deliver that change and whether we've got the ability, as I say, to, to, to execute and govern. That's going to be the big challenge for us. Ben Habib, I want to thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you very much.